Become a sustaining member of the Commonwealth Club for just $10 a month. Join today. Welcome to the Michelle Miao Show at the Commonwealth Club of California. I'm John Zipper, the club's vice president of media and editorial. For those of you who are joining us for the first time, the Commonwealth Club is a 118-year-old nonpartisan, nonprofit organization dedicated to the civil discussion of important issues of the day. Any views expressed are those of the speakers. Now, we're producing hundreds of programs a year, even during the pandemic. So head over to commonwealthclub.org slash MMS for all upcoming programs in person or online plus podcasts and videos of past events. And keep your eyes uh, uh, open for the rollout of our new Michelle Miao newsletter coming very soon. If you're watching us live on YouTube, use the chat box to submit questions for our special guests today. Today's program is presented with our partners at Gappa Theater, part of an initiative funded by the California Humanities. Now, it's my pleasure to introduce Michelle Miao. She's the producer and the host of the Michelle Miao Show and a member of the Commonwealth Club's Board of Governors. Good to see you again, Michelle. Thank you so much, John, and thank you to all of you for joining us this afternoon. We have a great conversation for you, and I'm so excited for this panel. So let me introduce you to them. We have Peter Tui Silva, who is the Executive Director of the Kumukahi Health and Wellness Center. Amy Suyoshi, who's the Dean of the College of Ethnic Studies at San Francisco State University, also a journalist and activist. And Helen Zia, who is a journalist and an activist and also author, Asian American Dreams, The Emergence of an American People. Welcome everyone, thank you so much for joining us. Aloha, so glad to be here. Same here, hi everybody. Thank you. There's, a, there, there's an emergency happening. I think we're used to this now. It's been a year and a half of doing all this. And uh, so I apologize to all of you. But but hey, a great way to get us started and remind us how much we have gone through in this last year and a half. But why don't we begin with a brief introduction from each of you of how you got started in the work, what inspired you, and please do reflect on any of the, the history of our history that may have inspired you to do the work. Let's begin with Helen. Oh, well, I think I'm the oldest person here. That means there's a lot to say, so I'll try to give the um, short version. I'm um, a child of the of the uh, 60s and 70s when there were a lot of social movements happening. That's when I was, um, you know, growing up and watching that on TV. At the same time, it wasn't that long after World War II and the incarceration of Japanese Americans and the rise of a fear of China being communist and uh, the McCarthy period and all of that kind of stuff affected me as a as a kid as as well as the war in Vietnam was beginning. And I definitely felt that I was um, not welcome as an Asian American kid growing up. I knew I was different. I knew that uh, I was Chinese and I should be proud of it. But what did that mean about being um, part of the fabric of America? You know, I didn't speak Chinese. My father was afraid that if we spoke Chinese, we would be uh, discriminated against even more. So. He told my mother, don't speak Chinese to the kids, but he couldn't tell us what it meant to be Asian American. And so um, so I grew up at a time when, you know, um, African Americans, black people uh, uh, were rising up for equality and the right to just be human beings and uh, treated as first class citizens. And, and I have to say that spoke to me, even though I wasn't black. And I really felt that I was, um, I wanted to be part of a movement for change. At the same time, there was the uh, uh, Stonewall was just happening, the women's liberation movement. And really it was a time of great youth movements around the world. And I was part of that generation. So, um, so I, as a young person, really wanted to be part of, of making change in America just wasn't sure how that was going to happen when many people didn't even think I was uh, an American. And so um, so I got involved in different things. I uh, was very active in, uh, I guess you would say, um, 
uh, third world movement activities. Now that's sort of a retro term, and and uh, but but I was uh, organizing Boston with uh, an Asian American collective and a black collective. And it was right around then, I was in my mid twenties and uh, and I was also very involved in the women's movement, which was huge then too. And, and I was called to a meeting one day by my Asian and black um, fellow community activists. And they said, Helen, we've noticed you're hanging out with a lot of lesbians. We need to know if you're a lesbian because if you are, you know, uh, the black community and Asian communities have no, um, well, they didn't say queer people, they said have no homosexuals. And if you are, you would be damaging our movement and we would want nothing to do with you. Well, back in those days, you know, there wasn't anything called, um, uh, we didn't even call it coming out, it was, uh, or, or questioning. And I was at a point in my life when I was questioning and I did know some lesbians, but it wasn't like the entire women's movement was all lesbians, which is what they were implying. And so then they said, so Helen, tell us, are you a lesbian? And at the time, I, I, I'd I, never had a girlfriend. I'd never held hands. I didn't have a membership card. I didn't get the toaster oven. And um, so they said, so tell us, are you a lesbian? Because if so, you'll be expelled from our communities of color. And, uh, and so I said, no, I'm not. And for me, that was like stepping into the closet myself and slamming the door shut. And so I didn't stop being an activist. I continued, I ended up moving to Detroit, Michigan, where I was involved in the labor movement. You know, um, it was a time of, of, of people joining together to try to end apartheid in South Africa. And I would stand out at factory gates, handing out flyers and also trying to um, not deal with the closet that I had entered in my own mind. And so um, it really wasn't, and, and I guess I should say I was in Detroit, I got laid off by, you know, like millions of other workers at the time. Um, I had been working as a, as a auto worker in a factory and I got laid off and had to figure out what was next, you know, in terms of, um, uh, supporting myself. And that's when I became a writer. That's when I became a journalist to tell these stories. And my writing was a part of my activism. I wanted to tell the stories of of the uh, communities that had been rendered invisible. And as a young journalist, then the HIV crisis was happening. And I uh, was assigned an article about HIV, the pandemic that was just beginning then. And that's when my closet itself had to start, you know, thinking about what, what is this? What, who am I? And um, I ended up, you know, moving for work, but I think I also had to move to, to get away from the huge Asian community that I had become part of. And every other auntie and uncle was trying to um, match me with some guy. And it was like, no, I have to find my own life and and i moved i went to new york i uh came out and um and just to make a long story short i guess um i never stopped being an activist and during the time when uh, marriage equality first began when the three couples in hawaii you know filed suit to for the right to marry that's when i started writing about it and becoming involved in that i i i was fortunate to meet my soulmate and now my wife, Leah, who is, is uh, from Hawaii herself. And, um, and you know, we went to Hawaii to become part of the, you know, the organizing around the very first um, uh, ballot initiatives, I guess, to, to fight for the right to marriage equality. And, and so I guess I would just say that I, I see my trajectory and the things that I've wanted to do in my life, my journey, as um, trying to bring my whole humanity, my whole personhood into, um, you know, every part of my working life, my community, my, you know, uh, so that this being closeted either for myself or from my community at the time, you know, um, doesn't have to happen for anybody. So um, I'm still active, you know, even though 
even though with this pandemic, I'm in that category of the old and infirm and, and all that, but um, that hasn't stopped me. So sorry for going on so long, but that's, you know, my, my path. Always a treat to listen to you. Um, and, and again, new emerging audience we'll get to in a little bit when I ask you about how your work has evolved, but thank you for sharing. Amy. Sure, so uh, I'm a historian by training um, and I do work at the intersection of queer studies and Asian American studies. Um, and I would say that what first inspired me is just being um, queer and Asian. Uh, I, I just felt like uh, it, it was kind of difficult um, both dealing with family um, as well as community, the Asian American community that I was very much a part of um, at the time, uh, they, they basically rejected me. Um, and then also, um, I think finding a way in terms of my profession. Um, so in grad school, uh, you know, I heard many times that if I did queer studies, it was basically the end of my career. Um, and this was uh, in the in the late mid, mid it was in the mid to late nineties. So it was in the wake of the AIDS crisis. Uh, um, but I, I think that it's evolved since then. I, I feel like a, a bigger responsibility to the queer API community now that. Uh, my my work has been sort of uh, you know been published and things like that. It feels bigger than my individual self. Uh, finding community, finding purpose, and finding love in my work. I, I would say that um, initially it was really to nurture myself when I em embarked on this work. Thank you, and Peter. Aloha, everyone. Uh, I'm calling in here from Hilo, Hawaii, on the Big Island. Um, you know, I really grew up in a very suppressed household and told that I was wrong and um, had to pretend that I was somebody I was not. And so uh, after I graduated from high school, I was like, I'm out of here. I'm going to UH Manoa. My dad is like, no, no, stay. I'll buy you a truck if you just stay in Hilo and, <laughs> you know, we'll pay for everything. I'm like, no, I'm done. I, I'm never coming back. I told myself. And I ended up at UH and there was this clandestine group of people of APIs called uh, the UH Gay Alliance. And it was really me and a lot of um, Asian Americans that we kind of met in secret and kind of were that self-support for one another. Um, and it really helped to build our own um, leadership, to help build our self-confidence. And what had happened was during this time, the 100th anniversary of the Hawaiian overthrow happened. And so um, I had a friend that was in the group and he's like, you really should come along and help out with this movement. And I said, yeah, of course, for my people. And so we went to it and it was a very powerful experience, but I still felt less than, you know, I still felt like I didn't quite belong. And what happened was a couple of the queer women um, that were part of the movement um, Kume Aloha, she had formed this group, Namamo, and it was really LGBTQ uh, Native Hawaiians and allies coming together to show that we support this cause, but we also identify with our with um, this side of ourselves. And it was such a very powerful experience that led me on a trail um, to become who I am today. I was able to work at uh, UH Manoa on the President's Task Force for Sexual Orientation. I was an activist on the, on the campus. And <clears throat> um, what happened was there was an opening at Life Foundation, which is uh, the aid service organization. And I became a prevention worker. And, went out and helped to educate people about HIV. And at that time, it was a very um, white man's disease. People came here to die, right, on vacation. And as time went on, when the drugs got better, we saw that people were living longer, greater lives. But we also saw that our native uh, native PI people, our Asian folks, were getting HIV. And in our department, there was no one reaching out to them specifically. It was very generalized. And so um, I was able to put together a group that really celebrated who we are and, and, and bring in the elements of uh, our Pacific Island heritage and mix that in with 
HIV education. And so from that, you know, it's been quite a long journey. I became the executive director. I ended up moving home. They let me back. Thank goodness. <laughs> I'm so happy to be back. Honolulu is just so crazy now. It's so nice to, to be in a rural area again and do this work for um, all, of, all that I've really learned from people on the continent, from our API uh, Wellness Center, American Health Forum, um, Caesar, you know, all of these people that have instilled so much trust and knowledge in me to bring that back to my people here um, and leading now as the executive director of Kumukai Health and Wellness. So um, I'm very happy to be here today and share my story. Yeah, thank you all. There's something in common with each of your answers, which, you know, as we progress with our work and what inspires us or the history that has affected us, we continue on, you know, even stronger. There's even more of a reason to keep being active, as Helen had said. And so I'd love for you all to touch on the evolution of your work and its meaning today. And we can start with Amy. You know, Amy, I know that here in California, big conversation around the need for ethnic studies you know, talk about um, being in that position and then also how that may have affected even your writing. As you had mentioned, you feel a much stronger call uh, to address you know, the, the intersectionality of sexual orientation and AAPI or gender identity and so forth and so on. And so, Amy, let's start with you. Sure. So when I finished uh, grad school in 2002, uh, it was quite difficult for me to get a job, actually. There were a ton of Asian American history jobs. There was like a big, a big bubble of them across the CSUs in the state of California. And I applied to maybe five of them. Um, there were others also sprinkled across the U.S. Um, and I couldn't get an interview anywhere, which is normal. And I did get one job, and it was at state, and I was so grateful. And and I, I am grateful that I was able to get a job straight out of grad school. Um, but but what it what it showed me, it, it really told me sort of materially about the, the struggles of being at the intersection of ethnic studies and also queer studies. I was the first queer studies hire in the College of Ethnic Studies, and I was the first faculty of color hired in sexuality studies at state. Um, so there was a lot of expectation and pressure uh, put on me. Um, there, were, there were queers in the College of Ethnic Studies who just came by my office randomly and were like, Hi, my name is Jane, and I'm bi, or whatever. <laughs> I mean, it's, quite, it's quite odd, right? When you when you think about it, it it tells you that the environment is 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 so difficult that if there's one queer person, everybody's going to come out to them, right? Um, but with that said, you know, ethnic studies quickly became my home um, among BIPOC communities and within ethnic studies. Now we know that we're supposed to be queer friendly. It's not cool to be homo or transphobic, right? Um, things aren't perfect, but um, ethnic studies for sure has become a home where, where I've been able to thrive. I, I think there's a way in which when we're both queer and API and 5'2", which is me, you know, little, right, that we feel powerless in the world. Um, and what I really had to come to grips with was that, in fact, I did have at least some power, right, and it increasingly became more power. I had more voice in the world as I began to publish, right? as I got tenure, um, as I was asked to do things in the community, like um, help in the co-founding of the GLBT History Museum, help with oral history programs at uh, places like API Equality Northern California wanted to start. Um, and so all of a sudden my work, it felt like my skill set had, had deeper meaning. Um, before I used to complain that I'm the dyke that can't hold the hammer, right? I, I'm the I'm the queer, that, that the lesbian that can't change a tire. Like, I'm the, I'm the queer that can't do anything practical. You know, I can edit really well, right? I can read really well, but that's about it. Um, but what I've found is that, you know, particularly in the last 20 years, uh, that my skill set has become increasingly imperative but within a community that embraces history, right? And this is really remarkable. I think previously people thought of history as, as the white man's tool, uh, as, a, as a weapon of white supremacy. And all of a sudden, nonprofits, artists, all these folks are interested in using history as a radical intervention. Um, and in I've been super grateful. And I think at this point, you know, I, I talked earlier about what inspired me previously as my own personal struggle. Um, I, I think what continues to inspire me today is 
the way folks are 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 moving forward to change, right? Change the world. Um, both the ethnic studies community, those fighting for racial equity and justice, right? Uh, people who 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 want to read and learn, right? And feel empowered by reading. Um, those are the, the, the people who I'm, I'm very much inspired by now. Thank you so much. And, and Helen, I, I go back to, um, you know, the Vincent Chin story. And when you broke the story, I, I believe that, you know, main, it didn't even make mainstream media. Uh, and, and so now with a lot of the anti-Asian violence, it's like, we, we hear Vincent Chin being called upon the story of Vincent Chin and, you being called upon to tell the story again and again, I'd love to hear, you know, kind of uh, your answer to how your role has evolved. And even if that was like a moment in our history today, the relevance also has changed. I want to hear how your life has changed also, you know, with this crisis that we're going through. Well, First, I, I really appreciate what um, Amy was saying about history and that as a way of, of intervention um, change, uh, how we view history and what is history, but how people have lived through times before and how they responded to whatever crises or catastrophes or or positive things that, you know, and, and who gets to tell it and whose lives do you amplify? And so as a journalist, that, that's one of the things, and as an activist, I mean, it really is all of, uh, it, if, if you are not being seen or heard, how can your communities get any attention? And so being an activist in Detroit, uh, which was largely black and, and uh, uh, you know, also, you know, black and white, um, Asian Americans, back when I was in Detroit in the, you know, I got there in the late mid to late 70s. So we're talking about kind of ancient history, I think, to a lot of people. But there are parts of America where there are not a lot of Asian Americans or Pacific Islanders. And and we're viewed as, you know, not just aliens, but aliens from Mars. And so when something happens, um, how do we get people to connect to us as human beings and to see that if somebody like Vincent Chin is beaten to death with a baseball bat at a time when there's a lot of anti-Asian hate, you know, anti-Japan hate at that time. And today we're at this point with a uh, global anti-Chinese uh, hate that gets spilled over to anybody who's remotely AAPI, you know, um, and we just see it from all of the, the statistics of hate. And then you layer on things like sexual orientation or gender or uh, color or language. And, and it just sort of um, intensifies in terms of becoming a target. So um, for me, being a young activist in Detroit who went there to know the labor movement and having worked in a factory where I understood why people were so frustrated. I mean, that was when Vincent Chin was killed, it was year three of a terrible depression. Here we are, it's sort of the second year and, um, and you know, even before the first year was over, we started seeing all of these reports of attacks and, and there's no indication, no reason to believe that this is going to be ending anytime soon. So part of activism is con connecting to the dots of history and to, to see that what's happening today didn't just spring out and suddenly is a new thing, which actually was part of the reporting Back in you know early 2020, people were like, "Hey, what is this? What are Asians uh, experiencing? Is this new?" And then you'd have to say, "No, it's not new. It didn't begin today. It didn't be begin in the 1980s with Vincent Chin. It actually uh, it didn't begin in the 1940s with the incarceration of Japanese Americans. It didn't begin with the Chinese Exclusion Act in 1882. It actually has been going on for a long time." And um, Peter mentioned the the um, you know the hundredth year uh, anniversary marking the overthrow of the Hawaiian monarchy. We can talk about the genocide of the people of Hawaii, and so this is part of our history. 
And there have been people all through this history who resisted too. It's not just things that have been done to us. It's also about people who rose up, you know, to say, yeah, the Chinese Exclusion Act was bad, but then out of it, one of the resistors fought that all the way to the Supreme Court to fight for his right to be American because he was born there. And because of him, Wong Kim Ark, every American who comes from refugee or uh, immigrant stock, everyone, regardless of their race or continent of origin, can thank, you know, an Asian American for their right to be um, considered an American citizen. So, so part of the telling for me is not just telling what terrible thing happened on the night of June 19, 1982 to an Asian American, but also to connect that so people can see our humanity. And, and with time for me, it was also, you know, not just the ethnic racial stuff, but to also connect, you know, what's happening to our, 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 our you know, trans um, brothers and sisters to talk about what's going on today. Um, you know, hate crimes are up all over the place to, to black people, to queer people, the domestic violence is gone through the roof. And so we see we're in a, a time of, of, of uh, violence and crisis for many people. And for Asian Americans, it's about not being deceived by this uh, so-called uh, model minority racist myth that says if you're quiet and you don't speak up, you know, you might be treated as though you are an honorary white person or left alone. And this whole pandemic has just shown that, uh-uh, you can be an investment banker and actually the Asian American investment bankers in New York have come together because they think, oh yeah, we could get beat up too if we're in Times Square. So, so part of my evolution is how not just bringing myself as a, you know, my whole being to be able to say to an Asian American, largely an Asian American group who are thinking about race, to be able to say yes, and my wife, you know, and for them to hear that, <laughs> to, to, you know, whether it's subliminal, no matter how they react to it, but, but to know that, you know, we are, as human beings, we're all, I have complex complexities and they're not just one item and none of us are. So th that's where all of this has led me and um, uh, to try to keep doing that, because if we don't do that ourselves, we're always going to be um, uh, invisible in some way or another. Mm. Which is a great segue, Peter, for you to talk to us about the evolution of, of your, you know, your work, your activism, and especially around visibility and during, a, you know, experiencing these crises and providing services for marginalized groups in our community that may be overlooked or aren't included in data report, reports. So, yeah. What about you and evolution of your work? Yeah, I, I really echo the sentiments of, of Helen and Amy, um, especially for our PI community. Um, it, it, it can be looked at as such a small, um, non-important, just sort of brush them over um, community. And, you know, it really does affect our people. And there's so much trauma that we've gone through. Like, I really did not get this, our future determines the past when we set this up. And then the more I thought about it was like so many people don't want to look at their past. So many people don't want to look at their past. And it's, it's, the, it's the present, it's the future of what's happening to our people now. And, um, you know, it's very, very, very disheartening to see our Asian American brothers and sisters and and all facing the hatred, you know, that collective hatred from other Americans that uh, need a scapegoat. And for our Pacific Island community, we've had a really, really hard time um, adhering to those mandates that were put on us. And so um, the death rates in the Pacific Island community are huge and it's outweighed every other group. Um, and it's it's disheartening um, because we are so 
connected to one another and families come together for birthdays and funerals. And that's the time where we are able to connect and pull away from being the assimilationist Americans that we're supposed to be to coming back to our roots as, as the people that connect to one another and connect to time beyond. So what we had to do was really get the visibility out there and really pull together leaders of our community to be on the commercials, to um, get the messages out. Sharing our truths and our realities and being exposed. And sometimes, you know, when you have dark history, uh, that can also present, you know, shame. Like, for, for example, like myself, I've always been shameful of my past, even growing up because my family were refugees and then, you know, we're poor and then they're immigrants and then I'm LGBTQ. And there were so many elements of being ashamed that I didn't really tell my story or I wouldn't tell the truth. And so I'd love for all of us to have an honest conversation about, you know, shame and how it, it has affected our work and, and maybe each of you can take a moment and you might not even have the same experience of shame as me, but maybe you've taken that shame and, uh, and created, you know, um, moments of power in the work that you do, which obviously all three have because <laughs> you've changed the world. Um, but let's talk about it. You know, when we're ashamed of some aspects of our history, do we not speak of it or do we acknowledge it? Amy? So... Thank you, Michelle, for um, you know sharing your vulnerabilities with us. Um, I think there's there's two types of history, right? One is like you know the the history that both Helen and Pierre laid out, history of Asians and Pacific Islanders in the U.S., and then there's the personal history, right, that we all feel that we may feel deep shame about, and I mean both both of those things. We shouldn't feel deep shame about it, right? Like when when we have a, a history of colonialism and trauma, right? Um, we should be proud that we survived it, right? Um, you know, on the flip side of that, you know, I'm, I'm I'm mixed Japanese and Okinawan, so I also know that you know Japan has a history of imperialism, right? And you know, there's a part of me that has to own up to that as well. And so it's super important to just embrace history fully for what it is and create a responsible present as well as future, right? To make sure that we're not as mean as we were in the past, you know, to put it very bluntly. Um, I think that like for many of us who have parents who make us feel ashamed about stuff, um, it's, you know, a difficult hurdle to, to overcome. I think also that white folks make us feel oftentimes ashamed for not being, you know, as great as they are, right? Um, but I, I think one of the things that's fantastic about, you know, being in a community that's affirming is that you learn, you figure out that all the things that you are that might be non-normative or that may, might be different are actually great sites of pride and importance, right? Um, I think, Michelle, you've heard me say this before, but we need to be embraced for our differences, not for our similarities that we all bring something different to, to the table, right? Um, so, so, you know, I look to gay men to be more flamboyant and self-confident, right? Um, I look to, to dykes to be more handy, right? <laughs> I, I, look, I look to like uh, trans folks to, to live a life that I wanna live, regardless of, you know, whatever people say to me, right? And so there's all these different things on the queer plate that, that, that is, that's not us but we love it all because it's so different from who we are. Um, I, I also wonder, like, I think it's important to, to also, you know, be involved in self-care, right? Like we hear this particularly during COVID uh, that self-care is an act of radicalism when, when people are constantly trying to, you know, tear us down. Um, and so I think also during this pandemic with BLM as well as Stop API Hate, the College of Ethics Studies at State has, has been through quite a bit, right? We've had a large number of illnesses and deaths in our college, right? It's nearly all students and faculty who are BIPOC, right? And it's hit us pretty hard. Um, 
And, you know, it's been difficult for me to be upbeat during the past year and a half. I remember this past summer, um, someone would ask me how I was doing and I was so exhausted. I just wanted to start sobbing. Um, and it, it's just really important for us to know that we need to take care of each other and it's okay to sob if you want, right? Um, I was telling my, my boss, the provost, that I'm just so exhausted. I, you know, I, I feel like sobbing with everything that we're, we're going through. Um, but it's, it's just important to kind of embrace all of the hurt, right? And then eventually, you know, try to be able to, to let it go. I think that for, for me personally, um, you know, I come from both a, a culture that's very, very uh, concerned about shame, which is the Japanese culture inside of me. But I also come from an Okinawan side that is more like, who cares? You know, <laughs> so, and to be frank, I, I think like my dad's Okinawan side really pulled me more towards him. So I'm very much like, you know, if I, if I could do this all day, I just sit on the floor in my underwear watching TV, no shame, right? Uh, which is not really what my mom's side you know, how the family would want me to do. So again, I, I think it's good to embrace, embrace whatever stuff is going on, but to really kind of not, not be ashamed of who you are, what you, what you want to do and what you need to do. Um, part of being queer also is to be sex positive, right? So, you know, that's great that you're into kink. That's great that you want to have multiple partners. You know, you, you don't, you don't have to subscribe to all the things that are normal in sort of the heterosexual world. And, it, and it's not a sin. It's, it's not something to be ashamed of. You should be, be proud of it and embrace your sexuality. Um, and that's, you know, something that the queer movement has definitely taught us. Yeah. I love it. Anyone want to add in, to our conversation around um, feeling ashamed of our, our, our history or our dark moments? I just want to say how much I loved everything that Amy just said. And to, to say that shame, you know, shame, really, if we could get rid of it, that would be great because it really is a, a, a whole way of isolating people. And if making change, whether it's organizing or trying to change the, the, the get a stoplight on your corner or um, do anything in the world, it's all about connecting. And um, seeing our commonality with people that we're, we're, you know, we're human beings together and we're in this on this little round blue planet together. And things like shame set us apart. I mean, they, they tell us to go into our little cave and to not tell anything of our own stories, to not see the connectedness of whatever uh, pain I might be feeling because I, I stepped into a closet to think that I was going through that all by myself. And then to learn that, you know, it wasn't just me, but this is something that many, many, you know, queer people go through and it's it's harmful, it's damaging, you know, the, the, the psych, psychic effects of shame. And so I think in a political context, shame has a very big role to play to keep people apart, to keep people silent and quiet and to think that whatever's happening is our own fault. It's our fault that this is happening and we should hide it as opposed to saying, well, what's causing this and why should I be ashamed of this? And if I'm not alone and there's something we could do together to actually improve everybody's lives and be contributing members of society instead of hiding out. I mean, so I, I think there's something very damaging uh, individually as well as, um, you know, in a, in a community context. To have shame and i just wanted to say amy i'm actually very good with power tools and the hammers and fixing things but uh, but that doesn't you know so it's one little skill you know skill set it doesn't mean that every dike has to right you're your, your gold star helen your gold star <laughs> dike <laughs> uh, uh i i'm not any good i can't do anything practical either amy so we're in the same boat. <laughs> uh, Peter, any any thoughts about uh, you know shame? 
Yeah, shame and shame and stigma. I mean, it's one of the biggest things we fight. Certainly with um, the HIV epidemic, that's what leads to us getting HIV or getting getting unhealthy is because of shame and stigma. And it's just really interesting because it can come from our own community. You know, if you if we just be quiet, if we just be the model minority, or we just get by, you know, we feel that pressure from our peers even. So it's hard for us to just step out. And, and, and stand up for those that really can't, can't do that. Um, one of the things that we, I noticed when I joined the uh, prevention department at the HIV Foundation in Oahu was there was nothing for uh, local API at all, and especially PI. There, um, it was all just the standard westernized um, methods of re- trying to reach people. And what I did was look to San Francisco um, and the Utopia movement there. And it was a group of Pacific Islanders, a lot of them living with HIV, that came together to celebrate their Pacific Island heritage. And so I was thinking, aha, you know, that's something that we need here in Hawaii. So I went up to San Francisco and got to meet with them and actually got to march in the San Francisco Pride Parade that I was sobbing. That one, I was, I just couldn't believe how much acceptance and how much beauty, you know, there is in everyone. And especially our Pacific Island float would win first all the time, which is so cool. Um, And so I brought that back and used that as a platform to be like, hey, we, we dance at hotels, we do these luau things. Why don't we do this for ourselves and for our family? And so what we did was to find pride within ourselves and our culture and put on a luau and actually try and invite our families to come and see us as we were. So men dancing in the women's line, TGs dancing in the other line, you know, and just that thing that you always wanted to do when you're looking at a luau, like, I don't want to do the haka. I want to do a pretty hula. <laughs> you know? So we got to do that. And by bringing the families there, it really helped to, to work on being ashamed and build pride in, in our community. And though it didn't work for all the individuals that participated, there was actually community conscious raising that the Mahu group, the the gay, the gay movement was a very strong part of what's happening in Hawaii. And I'm just really proud to say that me and these friends that that we created by going to Utopia San Francisco was able to actually make a difference in stigma and shame. It's the biggest thing, one of the biggest obstacles. Um, out there. And so having those that were HIV positive dance or HIV negative, you know, it didn't matter, queer, transgender, just being all together and putting on a great show like we know how to do and having our parents actually cry in the audience and say, God, this is my child. They're so amazing. I accept them for what they do. That was a really, really powerful experience. And that's, that's, you know, what we're charged to do. If we're given this platform, we're charged to just make those small incremental changes to the future that can help us accept our past. Mm -hmm. I love that. I love that. And that's a great segue to the next question. And, you know, I've heard many different responses from community members, people saying, you know, we have to stop saying that history is repeating itself. I mean, you know, some people feel that this is part of that you know, historical racism, this was on purpose, or some folks have said, I'm tired of being resilient. I don't want to be resilient and want to thrive and want to live. Like I should never have to be resilient against all this oppression and hate and racism. It's not how the world should work. But what are your thoughts on embracing our histories, our dark moments, our dark past, and how we can start move, move, you know, how we can define what is our, our future without always having to trace back to the past, if that makes any sense. How, you know, switching it, maybe the the past shouldn't have to define us. Maybe we create the future to define us today, which I think you all are doing every day of your life. Um, Who would like to begin for us? Can I just say, I don't get that. (laughs) I don't see why anybody, well, you know, nobody says to me, let's just forget about the past. You know, it's, it's, um, I just want to be here in the present. Um, If you do that in my mind, we will repeat. I mean, we can only uh, 
uh, move forward by learning from the past, no matter how far back we define that. There are a lot of lessons to be learned, and 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 that's how we can move forward and know what um, you know rough shoals to uh, to avoid. You know, knew know how who our friends are and who is, aren't. I mean, you know, why wouldn't you want to know? So I I just want to throw that out. I, I don't get it. Maybe Amy and Peter and, and you, Michelle, can enlighten me. But honestly, I think, you know, what they say is that it, the truth will set you free. And part of the truth is is what our, our experiences and our ancestors' experiences are. Why wouldn't we want to know them and honor them and figure out, you know, uh, another path? I think that was a hard one for me too, Ellen. It's kind of like that's where our strength comes from. And then, you know, I was really, really trying to think about this um, throughout the week that Caesar assigned me. I was like, what are you talking about, Caesar? <laughs> and I, I see it a lot in um, those that are justice involved, especially our um, API men. Um, there's just, they're living in, the, the trauma and the results of, of all of this um, occupation, all of this racism. And if, you, if we try to do this program of accepting culture with the people that I know that are living in the rural districts really heavily um, in, in, uh, involved with math and those type of things, they're not ready for it. They're not ready for it because they keep covering that pain um, and that hurt with with drugs and so um what we have to do is like i don't know it, it it's a journey it's a journey of of going through the justice system it's getting that opportunity to get in there and explain this is probably why what you're going through you know you're trying to self-medicate for generational trauma and trying to introduce all of those things that we had the chance and the opportunity to learn to help them see and it's really great we get to go into the jails we get to teach our hawaiian men about their culture but what's really sad is when they're released they go back into that same community um, that is oppressed that is in the hev uh, dealing heavily with with drugs and poverty and we still can't make movement. We're instilling some of that um, history and, and the powerfulness of our story, but they still gotta navigate their way with the results of racism and, uh, and oppression. So it, I, I kind of, looking at it from that point, that's where I could kind of see where embracing our past helps in some sense, but it's so dark. Sometimes it's so dark that people can't see it and embrace it and and use it to help, you know, themselves move forward. I mean, I also had difficulty when Caesar first uh, approached me when he was like, our future determines our past. I was like, what does that mean, Caesar? Right? Um, and I was thinking about it and um, I was also, you know, just trying to read some stuff to see if I could make sense of it. And I came across um, Susan Stryker, who's a queer and trans theorist, she did an interview uh, uh, in roughcutpress.com on the web. And she said that um, the, the, the past is actually fluid and flexible, which I think is absolutely true, right? A professional historian would say that history is a set of interpretations, right? So what the history that we tell therefore is constantly changing, right? And it's not to say that, you know, you can make up history and tell lies, right? It's just that, the perspectives that we keep unraveling and illuminating are constantly changing of the past, right? So what does that mean? Like, it is true that the way we talk about the past has changed in the past 50 years, for sure, let alone the past 30 years and even the past 10 years, right? So, you know, in the past, no one cared about Juneteenth except for a specific population of folks that cared about, uh, you know, when they viewed emancipation to take place. But now NPR is talking about Juneteenth, right? As something that we all need to think about in terms of not just you know African American or Black history, but the history of the U.S., right? So um, I also think that you know Helen, you, you revealed to us before we came on that um, folks are thinking about turning the Vincent Chin story into 
make a mainstream um, television show or, or movie. And that is incredible to me, right? Like who cared about that history previously? No one did, right? I mean, I mean, I shouldn't say no one. The Asian American community very much cared about it, but it seemed like no one else really cared. Um, I would even say that, you know, um, since since um, the videotape of the Thai grandpa uh, getting killed came out and Stop AAPI Hate went national, right? Um, that I've gotten a tremendous amount of inquiries to do API queer history lectures. Um, before, when the when the article first came out, titled "Breathing Fire" with the National Park Service, I'd maybe get asked to do a lecture, you know, once or twice a year. And the article came out in 2016. Uh, but this past Pride in June, seven folks, and these are not just institutes of higher education, but corporations. Uh, the SEC, they all asked me to do that same talk over and over again. I was, and I was like, what? You care about queer Asian Pacific Islanders? Since when? I was so shocked. Last month, Estee Lauder actually reached out to me and asked me to, to do that talk for them, um, for their company. Uh, and it, it's just been shocking to me. And in that way, I do think history is fluid, that that people can are able to the future, meaning what happens in the future, what what might happen in the future, informs how we think about about the past. Mm. Yeah, I was just going to say, if I may, just add. I mean, I think the part of history that is really important, good or bad, um, are the the thoughts, the 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 work, the activism, the inspiration, like what you all started, if, why did you get into this work? If we were to take all of your data and learn from it, and I'm a part of the future, then I would be able to determine, you know, some, I guess, a change, a change that I would be able to imagine, you know, for uh, my present community. So it's a really different radical approach of, of looking at things, but you're all right. I mean, we can't escape our past. It is part of who we are. And while we're here, we can start making decisions and sharing thoughts of what our future can look like. And so I'd like to spend the last um, seven minutes or so of our program talking about, you know, what I think we are all striving for is, you know, justice, equality and equity for our communities. And so telling our stories and the truths about our, our, uh, our I'm sorry, I'm going to jump to my very last question here. So though people can understand the past, will they necessarily learn from it to make decisions that make the future stronger and more just and equitable? And any one of you can begin. Understanding the past is such a powerful part of who we are, right? As Asians and uh, Pacific Islanders. And I think we, you know, it, it's funny, we are the future. <laughs> us with our gray hair <laughs> it's sort of we are the future helping to pave the path for those that don't yet understand um, that don't quite have the opportunity or that space to um, explore it we have to create safe space spaces for folks to understand their past because it's very traumatic and it's very painful um, and um, I think there were people that really paved the way for me you know, that did it for me. And I would have run oblivious if there wasn't those, if there weren't those people in my life to create that space uh, where I felt comfortable with who I am and not necessarily knowing uh, I was Pacific Islander, knowing my history and that, you know, we all just try and grow up to, to be the best we can for our parents and for our family and to make it big. Um, but there's some serious trauma that's there. <laughs> <laughs> lots of sobbing that occurs and then it leads to a lot of anger right and that's just a part of the process but helping to channel that anger into activism is one of the most powerful things that happened in my life and we here um Amy, Helen, and, and Michelle just trying to create that path for those that are coming um from from the other generations this is this is who we are. This is um, the future that we want for our people is to be just and equitable. And 
just doing the work that we've done is going to make a difference for those that come after us. And it only gets better. I mean, to really see these folks with uh, BLM and, and the API movement, you know, is not something that I could have done back in my age, uh, back in my younger years. You know, it's so great to see that we've created a platform and an, an open space that people can feel comfortable to do this because it was truly, truly scary. Just looking back on that little UH group where we met on the side of campus and just talked in hushed tones and put on a little, you know, razzle dazzle mataz for each other. <laughs> it's come a long way. Amy? Yeah, um, I, I do think that... Um... I mean, I'm, I'm really in, inspired, actually, by, by everything that's going on. You know, even though, uh, you know, six months, five months ago, I was uh, sobbing by myself in, in this little room because um, I was so exhausted. I want to say that I feel like it's the first time um, in my adult lifetime that I feel like people have actually cared about the future. And when I say people, I'm saying like mainstream America, like obviously queer activists, folks in ethnic studies, right, have, have always cared about the future, right? But it's really the first time that there's masses and masses of people who really care about the future. And that to me is, is super moving. I think that because they care about the future, they want to rethink the past, meaning to rediscover it, uncover the darkness, shed light on it, and do something about it. Um, I, I think that history, it, it should not be just learning for knowledge's sake, but it really needs to go somewhere, right? Uh, it should motivate you to feel stronger about yourself and also make the world a better place. That's what ideally history should do. And I, and I do think that we're in a different place where the nation, to me, feels ready to do that. Curious um, to hear, Helen, your thoughts, especially yeah, especially because mainstream media now is so interested in what you have to say, which a lot of it has been what you've been saying for a really long time. And uh, if that gives you, if you feel the same as Amy, if that, if you feel like, you know, more and more people do care, especially around anti-Asian hate and discrimination. Well, I think we are at a moment where there is interest, there's, they cannot hide, you know, I mean, the pandemic really did kind of throw open, you know, all of the pretense or the, the hidden, well, most of, let's say most of the pretense, um, but the idea that there are um, people who are more vulnerable, who are suffering, who are dying, who are more exposed and who society depends on as essential workers and that society can't do without. And so the conversations about equity, you know, the Black Lives Matter movement, the who's getting attacked, um, how Asian Americans are, you know, they can't, they can't uh, deny the, the data that's coming out of San Francisco State and the Stop a API Hate um, website. I, I mean, it's, Whereas in the past, people could put a smoke screen, uh, the mainstream media or the you know politicians or whatever could just uh, try to ignore it and hope that people would go away. Now they can't, it's irrefutable. And so we have a moment that I, I mean, then it's up to our communities to stand up and make sure it, it doesn't stay a moment that we, you know, Peter said, create a space. That's what we who, know a little bit about the past and the present and are thinking about the future that that I agree with, you know, that that is hopeful. And um, but we have to do something about it. I mean, the thing is, we can't just sort of passively think that, oh, you know, they're paying attention. Well, as soon as they don't have to, they won't unless we make them. And I, I think in terms of people who 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 are so overwhelmed or, you know, have so much um, pain and trauma they're carrying that they just don't want to hear this stuff. I think we have to recognize not everybody is all in the same place at the same time. And that's what movements are about. You have some people who, you know, are willing to be in the front and there are, are people who are, are not sure um, or can't deal with it. You know, I mean, um, I remember when I was a college student and I was an activist on campus and I was, uh, you know, would tell all my friends, oh, this person's coming to speak. You really have to come and hear them. And one of my very good friends said to me, 
you know, Helen, you care about that. I don't. Please leave me alone. And it's, you know, you do your thing. Let me do mine. And, you know, that was cool. She set the boundaries. I felt bad. This is my good friend who said this to me. We stayed friends. And years later, years later, when she had a kid who was having, um, you know, it, uh, just stuff going on at school about being Asian American, she called me up and she said, can you recommend anything, you know, to read or something that can help my son? And, and it's kind of like, I didn't say to her, remember what you told me, if you had paid more attention then, you know, um, it was kind of like, yeah, okay. But so people, I guess I want to say to activists who feel like, you know, not everybody wants to hear what I'm doing, you know, or why we should all like build a movement, you know, or whatever. It's like, don't think that it disappears. It goes in people, people put it somewhere. And if they're not ready to join in today, one day they might. And so um, the key thing is that we have to, those who are ready to do something really have to. We are at that time today and we are the future. You know, if we just look at the demographics, I mean, that's what history will tell you. We are the future. And if you bring BIPOC people together, you know, these different movements, the uh, Me Too movement, the environmental justice people, I mean, we're the majority today. You know, and and so we can't let all the things that have been imposed upon our communities to keep us apart, like shame. You know, if we can deal with these things and come together, I mean, we're the future. We're we're the present. We are now, and so that's what it's going to. Um, that's the task at hand. Those are the greatest words to end this amazing program with. We are the future. Thank you so much, all of you, for joining us this afternoon. Thank you to Gapa Theater for bringing us together. And of course, thank you to our amazing speakers, Helen Zia, Peter Silva, and Amy Siyoshi. Please follow, support their work. Uh, very easy to find them as well. And thank you to the Commonwealth Club of California for providing the platform for us to come together today. For more programs, you can head to commonwealthclub.org slash MMS. Thanks again. We will see you next time. Aloha. Everybody. Thank you. <laughs>